Hello, everyone, and welcome again to tonight's webinar. This is part of an educational program on innovation in duodenoscope design, uh, sponsored by the AGA Center for GI Innovation and Technology. This program supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Boston Scientific. And it's the first of two webinars that are part of the overall program that also includes six expert editorials and their associated podcasts. And you can find all of this information at the website scopeinnovation.gastro.org. And also you can follow uh, our updates on the hashtag on Twitter, Scope Innovation. Now, the learning objectives for this program are to describe the causes of duodenoscope-related infections, identify recent advances in duodenoscope design that are intended to reduce or eliminate uh, duodenoscope-related infections, and explain some of the benefits and pitfalls of these innovative uh, scope designs. Today, we're going to hear from my colleagues, my co-chair of this program, Dr. Adarsh Thacker from UCLA, his partner, Dr. Raman Muthasami, and then my partner at UChicago, Dr. Christopher Chapman. Here are disclosures. And today's webinar will focus on infection control in endoscopy, defining the scope of the program. Problem, sorry. Are, and then we have a couple poll questions for our audience members. First of all, are you aware of the problems related to ERCP infections? We'll give this a minute to come up. All right, I'm going I don't, oh, great. This is a very astute audience. 92% said they were aware. That makes this, uh, this session tonight, I think a little bit more useful. So we'll start out with the magnitude of the problem by my co-chair, Dr. Thacker. Great, thank you, Dr. Siddiqui, and uh, yeah, thanks to the, the other panelists for joining us this evening. So, I'm just going to try to set the problem from a historical perspective. Um, you know, they more recently, probably the last five or six years ago, there were some highly public outbreaks of infections linked to duodenoscope. But when you actually look back, this is not a new issue, and we can go all the way back to really the beginning of endoscopy when there were infections linked to endoscopy, including in the 70s or 80s with Salmonella, in the 80s with Pseudomonas. In the 1990s, actually, H. pylori transmission from one scope to another, um, a highly publicized scare of hepatitis C in a few cases in the late 90s, and then really the 2000s showed us these quote unquote superbugs or multi drug resistant organisms, um, uh, including a CRE outbreak uh, that was really from 2012 to 2015 from Europe and then the United States. And despite all of these outbreaks and all the changes that we made, even yet again in 2021, uh, yet another uh, superbug, if you will, a mobile cholestin resistance one positive Klebsiella, MCR1. So even though there's been a lot of attention on this subject the last few years, uh, it's still happening. And so there's a few things about this. It's still by the numbers, the magnitude would be considered rare, but there's a couple of problems with just minimizing this issue. Number one is that even though it's a rare and perhaps not as many patients are affected, despite the number of endoscopies we do safely every single day, it's a highly public problem. And uh, you know the media is very involved. Infection control is very, very uh, much at the center of uh, of the of discussion right now with the COVID pandemic. Um, and so, despite it being uh, potentially small numbers, it's still uh, quite public, and it can affect uh, us as uh, a system or as a field uh, quite severely. The second is there's some risks that are inherent to doing any endoscopy, and and we all know. For example, bleeding after a biopsy or removing a polyp, it happens no matter what we do or prevent pancreatitis after ERCP. But in the case of cross-contamination between scopes, this is actually a preventable harm. And so it's a little bit different than the risks uh, inherent to any procedure. Now, when we look back historically at these uh, various kind of outbreaks of various different organisms, there's a few themes that keep emerging and looking back historically. Number one is that the, the reprocessing is complex and very much prone to human error. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, in the case of the uh, duodenoscope, it was the elevator tip looking at postmortem. Um, duodenoscope has a complex uh, end because we have to make devices make turns, and it was found that little cracks and crevices behind the elevator tip, bacteria can get inside, and then our reprocessing methods 
uh, were potentially not working. Either there was a, a, a violation or a, a, a disruption of something that uh, from the reprocessing, so human error, or even if everything went perfectly right, sometimes the design of the duodenoscope itself prevented the reprocessing from being effective. So human error, the reprocessing, both complex. The third thing is that uh, if, we, if we go to the next uh, slide, these are just some additional pictures, but it may not just be the elevator tip. And that's where the culprit has been kind of identified with the more recent outbreaks. But as we can see in the bottom left, and I think there's one more slide that we can go forward. Here's a close up. And then here that there's little, maybe dev damages or little crevices, debris. And while the clinical significance of this remains uncertain, we're finding it. And so the question is that even though we've made all these changes, are we just in a little calm before the next outbreak of something else that's attributed to one of these things, just like we would have potentially said in the 80s or the 90s or the 2000s before the most recent outbreak? Or, uh, or have we actually found some solutions, which we'll be exploring in the rest of this program um, and others? The, the final thought is that really all of the changes we've made over the decades have been reactive. You know, one of these outbreaks happens, we do a postmortem, we do a root cause analysis, and we identify something, and then we change something about reprocessing. But despite that, it keeps happening, right? We, we, I just listed off all of those things. So are there things that we can do to be proactive instead? And so these are some of the issues that I hope that we can discuss, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion on it. All right, I think that was a great uh, summation of, of the issues that we're dealing with. And now we'll move on uh, to Dr. Chapman, who will talk to us about the impact of equipment design on this issue. Uh, thanks, Uzma and Adarsh, for uh, inviting me for this talk. It's my pleasure to talk more so about the design of the duodenoscopes. And I think it's one of those things that we all are starting to acknowledge, uh, whether you're in the community, whether you're a patient, whether you're a provider, or you're a governmental agency like the FDA, that this is an area that needs to be improved upon. Um, there are currently three manufacturers of fixed end duodenoscopes, what we consider a traditional duodenoscope. And all of these are prone to being at risk for being contaminated and potentially transmitting infections. But also all three of these are required to perform high level di disinfection reprocessing between uses. And so there are inherent designs that Adarsh kind of talked through that make it more difficult to do manual and automated disinfection. The most common thing we talked about, again, are the microscopic crevices that develop around the elevator area. We constantly hear about the O-ring and being exposed to microbial fluid that thus can't be adequately accessed when doing manual and automated disinfection. However, you also have to think about things with the traditional fixed end cap as the use of adhesives to permanently affix the end cap to it. When you have repeated use to this area, repeated cleaning, you can get microscopic cracks and crevices in that that can also hold bacterial contents and thus be a risk for uh, becoming continuously contaminated. And then finally, for those providers that are using older scope models, maybe like the 160 Olympus series, they actually have an open elevator wire channel that this could also be another source of being accessed uh, to microbial fluids that can't be cleaned out as easily. Now, some of the more newer models have a more closed elevator wire channel, so that's not really an issue. But for some of these older models, depending on what model you use in your unit, you have to be aware of these types of changes. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And so as a result of these infection risks and these design flaws, I would say, in 2019, the FDA really started saying that they made a recommendation that there needs to be innovative designs to enhance safety. And what they really were hoping to accomplish was really try to either um, make the reprocessing uh, more easy, more effective, or potentially even unnecessary. And as a result, that has really resulted in, in the clearance of several new devices, including six duodene scopes with disposable components that facilitate reprocessing and one protective end sheath device. Now, we're going to talk a lot about this in more detail about the, the designs and some of the data that's coming out. And we have one of our nation's leader, Dr. Uh, Muthasami, on here to help kind of go over some of that data. But we're really going to talk um, about all of these things. And, and I, want, I can't wait to hear that discussion. But the no, novel duty and scopes with disposable end caps have the benefit 
theoretically of maintaining that high definition quality and the scope responsiveness. So one of the studies that was published talked about the maybe some of the disposable scopes being a little more stiff or some of the views being not as good. So that's what the disposable end caps may be able to provide. The sealed, uh, the single use device that seals the end is kind of a sheath really has, from my knowledge, only really been kind of on the bench top level. It hasn't really penetrated into the market that well. We don't have really much data on that just yet. But probably the hottest area where I think a lot of us are really focusing on and talking about are the use of these now fully disposable single use duodenum scopes that have been cleared by the FDA. And the benefit of this is clearly that they will eliminate the need for reprocessing and any risk of infection transmission to our patients. So really taking a problem that might be rare, as Dr. Thacker said, and taking it completely to zero. All right. And then we'll follow up the discussion and see where these scopes uh, may fit into our daily uh, work life. And Dr. Muthasami will talk about the types and prevalence of infections and the suggested solutions. Yeah, so uh, thank you. And uh, that was a great introduction by Dr. Stacker and Chapman uh, in sort of some of the challenges of, uh, of what we've seen and, and what we need to fix. And, um, you know, I think that the challenges that we face is, and I would say is, is it's very hard to prove a negative. So, you know, if a patient comes and says, doctor, how do you know that my scope is clean today? You know, and how many, how do I do that? You know, I can say, well, we, we reprocessed it, but how do you know that it was reprocessed adequately? Do we use culture? Do we use protein? Uh, do we use some other form? Do we use a bore scope to sort of take a look? Um, do we need to do all of those things? And I think the, the, the challenge is we don't currently have a gold standard that can accurately document the adequacy of reprocessing uh, after undergoing high level disinfection. So that's one of the challenges because if we are going to have a system where we continue with reusable devices, then we have to sort of have a way to A, show their efficacy, and then a gold standard we can agree upon to compare different solutions and technologies in terms of which one works better, you know? And so I think that's one of the big challenges that we have with the existing sort of system of reprocessing. And the advantage, as was discussed by Dr. Chapman, is that uh, single-use devices provide uh, essentially the elimination of, uh, of all of these issues. You know, even you don't, you don't have to reprocess it fully or have to check to see if it is, because it won't ever be used in another patient again. And, you know, and I, I'll just briefly mention now that there are five published studies uh, that have looked, um, they've all come from, there are two devices that are uh, on the market. Uh, all of them have been with one device, uh, and that device has uh, got now 400 publication, 400 cases over five separate publications. And, uh, and basically, they've all sort of essentially come in uh, in that sort of 91 to 95, 97% um, success rate without crossing over. Uh, and the appearance of, uh, in terms of time, uh, in terms of across a variety of complexities, um, and in terms of adverse events is comparable to what you would see with reusable devices. So we do think at least in sort of the expert hands that have used it so far in these publications, uh, that these are feasible devices. Uh, but I would also say that clearly these devices were developed uh, for the issues that were outlined earlier by Dr. Thacker, uh, which uh, is this risk of infection and the numerous outbreaks that have occurred um, across the globe over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, and, uh, but I would say that, you know, like any advance in technology, there are ancillary benefits that can occur. So I think that, you know, I got involved with this project uh, on single use devices in 2017, and it's now 2021, and we've already had essentially three iterations of the device in So uh, that's, uh, that's a rapid rate of improvement that we typically see. Um, and again, there are some advantages. You can develop uh, ergonomically better scopes uh, that are lighter, uh, customizable for people with smaller hands, right-handed, left-handed. Uh, and you may also be able to develop specialty devices uh, that can be used uh, in unique situations. Uh, in those cases where there may be maybe an extra thin scope that can go through a tight stenosis that you might have otherwise you know, had to use an alternate technique. Uh, scopes specifically designed for alternate anatomy or varied patient position or other things. So, so uh, again, we may see some very custom boutique scopes that can be developed. 
obviously the concern is the cost, the concerns of medical waste, and clearly those will have to be addressed. Uh, and also, you know, there is, I think the concern about whether it will be durable and, and comparable to existing reusable devices, uh, as I mentioned, the data just uh, above uh, is starting to get eased. Uh, next slide. So I think, you know, in, in, in where we, you know, where I think that potentially there's use for these devices, uh, we'll talk about, uh, you know, in terms of patients, I think the obvious answer is that someone who you know has a multi persistent organism and you just want to avoid contaminating your device and transmitting that uh, to another patient, that would be kind of the obvious low-hanging fruit uh, to do that. Fortunately, that's probably going to be a relatively rare indication, um, but as we develop more antibiotic resistance, that could be a, a bigger issue in the future. Um, we also, in our institution, we also use it in patients who are critically ill and we feel would not be able to withstand a scope of uh, acquired infection. So people in the hospital with sepsis, you know, compromised, we tend to use it for uh, our patients uh, with the cholangitis who have cholangiac carcinoma, pancreas cancer, or transplant patients. Uh, and we also use it in those procedures that we think have a higher rate of bacteremia often due to bacterial transplantation. Um, uh, and so that would include cholangioscopy. Uh, as well as perhaps biliary RFA. And from both our own data and some data from uh, Chicago, uh, that, uh, that you know, the placement of a stent appears to be associated uh, um, in, with an increased risk of transmission uh, from a contaminated device. Finally, uh, as I mentioned, there's some ancillary benefits. You could utilize these devices uh, to uh, you know, perhaps uh, expand your scope of service. So many institutions now uh, have large systems are providing to many sites, and some are smaller and some are larger. And the smaller sites, uh, you know, may have a hard time having all the facilities and, and capabilities of the larger sites. Uh, and so, for example, if you can't really reprocess reading scripts well at one of your smaller sites, rather than ship this reusable device back across town to a larger facility, it might be an ideal opportunity for um, a, a single-use device. You can also use it, obviously, for interoperative cases nights and weekends when text may not be available. So there may be other applications. So, uh, so those are some applications uh, that I think that uh, single use devices may be utilized now and in the future. All right, I, gentlemen, thank you. That was a fantastic um, discussion and presentation on the scope of the, the problem in terms of infections uh, related to duodenoscopes. We have a couple more poll questions for the audience before we go into our panel discussion and Q&A section. This question is how many infections related to ERCP um, at your institution have occurred in the past two or three years? And I think when we get to our panel discussion, it'll be very interesting to hear the perspective of my colleagues from UCLA who did have an issue with an outbreak uh, versus us at University of Chicago, where we haven't had one yet, and you know how different hospitals and institutions uh, approach this issue based on their past experience. All right, hopefully soon we'll have the answer, or not. <laughs> okay, actually, half the attendees have had uh, an infection in the past five years, so that that'll be interesting uh, to look into further. Our next poll question, what changes have you made in your institution related uh, to safety of ERCP procedures? All right, so a lot of hospitals are using disposable end caps and single use duodenoscopes and sterilization. Interestingly, no one is using culture and quarantine, which is what we do at U Chicago. Um, and then 14% are not doing anything, which is a little bit scary, especially I don't, and we can talk about that too. There might be legal implications at this point because you should be aware of the issue, but moving on. All right, I think we're gonna open it up now to our audience for Q&A. Please submit questions to the Q&A box. Otherwise, I'll just, I'll start with uh, Raman and Adarsh. Perhaps you can tell us your experience at UCLA and how, you know, the past uh, outbreak has now shaped your current policy. Yeah, I mean, uh, we obviously had a, a well-reported outbreak in 2015, uh, and uh, that was uh, um, 
you know, widely publicized. Interestingly, we were we were the 19th site to have this issue, but uh, you know what was notable was we pretty definitively traced it back to the scopes and basically told the county department of public health that. Um, you know, institutionally, uh, obviously, you know, we, we take it seriously. We initially uh, bought a bunch of extra scopes. Um, you know, we had to figure out what we were going to do. Um, our hospital <clears throat> refuses to do culture and quarantine because they uh, said that the lab is not certified uh, to run environmental samples, which uh, technically would be what a sample from a device would be. So uh, we ended up uh, contact calling around and ended up using ethylene oxide, uh, which we still do to this day. Although, um, you know, it'd be interesting. I know that you folks in Chicago, I think in Illinois, I'm not even sure you're allowed to use ethylene oxide. I think it's, uh, there's some pretty strict regulation in the state there, but uh, many states don't allow it. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've been using that. Unfortunately, now uh, the company we use uh, has been limited in its ability to run the samples. So we can actually only clean our samples once a week. Um, and because they have now gone to once a week, they quadrupled our price. So uh, it costs uh, for us now, uh, it's approaching, uh, you know, somewhere in the range of, uh, um, you know, it's a one tote now has gone up to a couple thousand dollars for us. It can have up to four scopes in it, but um, which means it costs us many hundreds of dollars to run ethylene oxide on top of our standard high level disinfection. So it's been, a, it's been an ongoing challenge. We're looking to try to move to um, uh, liquid chemical sterilization and avoid the ethylene oxide. And, and I see we'll transition to that in the next year. And then, you know, Adarj, maybe you can comment how you have integrated single use scopes or disposable cap scopes into your current uh, regimen? Sure, so I, uh, in addition to working at UCLA, I also do ERCP procedures at um, some uh, nearby community hospitals, which are not UCLA. Uh, and so I, I, it's interesting because I've seen uh, the different solutions at different hospital settings, even though the hospitals are just miles apart. So at UCLA, um, we, we kind of looked at, I came in the wake of the, of the outbreak, we looked at which patients were the ones that got sick, and those were kind of the criteria that Dr. Mutasami had outlined earlier. And so that's what I keep in mind. And we do a huddle with our staff every day and look at our, our upcoming ERCPs and see, hey, we, which one of these patients might be candidates to use a single-use device. Um, it's typically older people already sick, potentially with uh, some type of active infection. They tend to be uh, patients with uh, immunosuppression on chemotherapy, so your hyalur strictures, malignant bile duct obstruction, or transplant patients. Um, so essentially those people that are most vulnerable, which were the ones that got sick, uh, or the ones least likely to be able to tolerate an extra infection on top of what they were already going. So we kind of have, uh, you know, even the staff is now uh, attuned to the candidates and the criteria, and they'll ask, hey, do you actually want to use the, the single use device for that for that procedure? And so um, that, that's one part of it. On the other hand, you know, the, I, I'm at an institution where um, it's, it's the not UCLA affiliated and it's an interesting uh, dichotomy because I hear them talking about, oh yeah, we, we use these, uh, these, these uh, disposable end cap scopes, which from my perspective seem to work yeah, the same as, as I remember before, but it come, this theme comes up of, oh, that was a UCLA problem, not a us problem, even though truly we share the same patient population. And I think it really highlights that this is, um, despite the, the case numbers actually reported being quite low, it's almost certainly vastly underreported. One maybe because we're not looking for them, right? You don't you don't go around asking every patient how they feel. Two is there there may be patients that are having the contaminated uh, kind of the contamination, but are it's a subclinical infection, or maybe they just don't feel so well, and we blame something else, and then they get better. So they may not necessarily getting the severity of infection. And then third, um, as Dr. Mutusami alerted, it's really hard to detect. You know, we, we really don't have a great way to find these infections, even um, sometimes culturing the scope based on the, the kind of the, the guidelines um, may not be helpful. And so, for example, at UCLA, our scopes, despite us knowing that those were the ones that may have been the culprits um, from, from kind of uh, the investigation that, that were done by our uh, infection prevention control department, uh, never actually cultured positive. And so the culture and quarantine, I think practically, I'm not sure that what we consider or call the gold standard actually is a gold standard. Um, and it goes back to, again, what Dr. Mutasami alluded to, how do you really know the scope is clean? And so um, kind, of, kind of a few perspectives, depending on which setting you're in, but 
Um, so far, we've, we've kind of honed some of our criteria at UCLA to, to use it um, in select cases. You know, Chris. I think, was my, I think that's fascinating that you guys, your everyone's experiences shape their thoughts on this topic a little bit. Oh, because, of course. Because we haven't had that exposure yet, or I haven't had any patients with a documented infection. I think I come at it with a completely different perspective, where I say you balance some of the, um, you know, negatives of the the just single use disposable scope with doing tough cases, you know, higher cases without having that background of being those patients that had that prior infection. And then becomes a different judgment call about what scope you think may actually be best for your patient. Um, and so I think we're all kind of have these different experiences and trying to understand what are the gold standards? Is contamination really the gold standard that we should be using in terms of infection risk? Or because are we ever going to be able to get a 0% contamination rate? And I think the answer is probably zero inherently what we're doing in a dirty, in a dirty place. No, I know, not to sound like that other hospital you mentioned, Ardash, but it's like, oh, it never happened to us. And so when this all started, you know, we leased 12 new ERCP scopes to give time for 48 hour turnaround when we culture and quarantine. Um, and, for, and our nurses do the culturing. So for years we've been doing it. They're asking now, why are we still doing it? We've never had an issue. Um, and, you know, these questions start to, to arise. Obviously, even if you have one outbreak, that's too many, but it hasn't been an issue. And, and we still, like everyone has says, we don't, you know, we don't know is contamination really, you know, what does that mean or not mean when we find it on a scope? Um, so I would say the single use scopes in our unit probably would get utilized at least in the beginning um, if say, not enough scopes were released from culture and quarantine. So then, okay, we'll use a single use scope. But for us, the, the comfort level with the reusable scopes is so much better. Um, and so we have not transitioned too much to the single use. And we don't have the disposable cap scopes yet, um, which brings up one question that came up in the Q&A box um, asking about reducing the risk of shearing with the disposable caps. I don't know, Adarsh, if you have more experience with the disposable caps scopes? Yeah, I think the, the answer is the same, whether we're talking about the disposable tip models or the fully disposable models, which is, you know, these are these are iterations of, of the design of the duodenoscope. It's not a replica. And so just like if you're, if you're training on a new procedure or using a brand new device, or you're going to a new hospital that maybe uses a different brand, um, I would just be cautious the first few times using it until you really get a good feel of it. And so, you know, I, I don't, I don't just uh, move down in the same exact way that I would if I'm using, for example, at UCLA an, a, an Olympus scope or a Pentax scope or something like that, whereas the other hospital has Fuji scopes. You know, they all, they all drive a little differently. So I think just be patient, take your time, um, go back to the fundamentals of when we first learned ERCP saying, okay, how do I get through the oropharynx carefully and safely? Um, just thinking back as if you're, you're training a fellow next to it, which actually ends up being uh, helpful because I, I think about what I'm doing as I'm trying to explain to the fellow why I'm doing it and what I'm doing. So getting through the, the mouth carefully um, at the GE junction, just pausing so I'm not slamming into the wall or a hiatal hernia, um, really making sure I'm, I'm putting the pylorus in the right position and not over insufflating, uh, being careful when I'm reducing and knowing which way I'm going. So I think just being patient, taking your time, and realizing that it is a different device and therefore you just need to get through that learning curve of the different feel uh, of, of what it's like. Yeah, a couple of small points. It's in such a, for example, I, I use a single use device twice today uh, and it's probably 50% of the cases I do now just because it's integrated so much in our facility. And I think it's like anything else, right? If you use it, you'll get familiar with it. It'll become, even our trainees have gotten kind of comfortable with it. Um, I always tell people who utilize single use devices, make a commitment to use it five to 10 times within a relatively short period, so you can get some familiarity with it. We certainly noticed that when we did the initial trial. And I sort of, uh, I sort of uh, chuckled, uh, Chris, when you mentioned uh, you know, a highly stricture case, the very first human case that was ever done with a single use device, that was case one of the series which I did, was a highly stricture case. So we didn't get to cherry pick and ease into it. So it actually- You really <laughs> went for it, you really went for it. Then. Well, yeah. it wasn't my choice, but that was just the way yeah. it happened. But, but, yeah, yeah. but the point is, is that, that uh, you know, it has been tested across a variety, but understandably, we're all familiar, you know, with advanced endoscopy. We all like our tools. We like different things. We're very comfortable. These are complex cases. 
um, you know, with high failure rates. And so, you know, we obviously want to use what we're comfortable with. But but uh, but I would say that the learning curve on these things is is not dramatic because they are mostly similar. You know, I think it's not like we're using joysticks or something very very different. I mean, but I think that is a big issue, especially you know, at our high volume centers with the complex cases you know, with a scope that you've been using for years, that case may be really difficult. And now you have a scope that I, at least with a single use, we could all agree is a little bit stiffer and the optics are not as good uh, or not as comparable, I don't think. But, you know, and even in the studies that say the use is as efficacious and comparable to the reusable scopes, the preference of the endoscopist is usually still for the reusable scopes over the disposable one. So, I think that's still something that you have to consider. And from my experience now, I'm part of a trial and I'm using it on every case. Uh, if you have altered anatomy like a Bill Roth II, it, it was not happening with the single use scope. So um, it's hard. It's hard to switch from a Cadillac to, I don't know, a bike and then try to, and then well, relearn a little. That's my own I think opinion. it's just, you gotta admit there's reiterations, right? And like, this isn't yeah. a technology either that's gonna continue to evolve and yes, we understand this is not going to be a perfect replacement. So there are going to be reiterations of this. And I think, Raman, you've probably seen that transition, been in the field so long, and how rapidly that can change. So, you know, right. It's no, not it perfect. is. And, and, and the and question is, do we, the question will ultimately be, do we have to change? You right. know, and exactly. who's going to make us? Exactly. And, uh, you know, the question is, this is sort of multiple solutions, right? And you don't know who's exactly going to win. It was, what if we get low temperature sterilization, whether it's ozone or something, right? Yeah. Maybe that'll be it, right? So, so you don't know, I, you know, but I, but I will say at least among the experts that use it, the median satisfaction was nine. So I think it's okay, but, but I do think that it's one of those things that, you know, I have to be honest, I've been using it for a fair amount of time now. And for me, I honestly don't even, it doesn't feel any different, you know, but that it just like anything else, you got to get used to it. It is different, absolutely. Yeah, going going back just a little bit um, yeah, to to talking about the different experiences of our centers, you know, one one thing that uh, that I kind of heard from from Raman and then others who are looking at just our endoscopy unit in general. Remember that we we all know here that it's this duodenoscope. It's probably the distal tip behind the elevator, and we could talk about the O ring and the crevices. But you know, to the public, it's uh, UCLA has a scope infection problem. And and they're you know they've got dirty scopes and dirty devices. So while we can here sit here and talk about it, it's it's not just ERCPs that are affected. It's really all procedures, and it it may actually spill over to the entire operating room, right? It's it's that UCLA has something dirty going on, and so the you know you, you can look back at some of the 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 perception. Whereas we actually you know they and, and really big credit to Raman and the team, they really honed in on the issue really fast, uh, you know, public disclosure um, and, and finding out where the problem was and identifying it. But I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it took about uh, three years for our screening colonoscopy rates to recover to where right. they were expected to be because of the setback. So even though it was not many patients, um, there's, there's a kind of the innocent bystander, uh, which, you know, again, it, it's not a problem for you until it is. And then when it is, it's a very big problem. And, so and I think that gets to a point of, of how these cost effectiveness studies are going to be so challenging to do because what are the what's the cost of one infection? What's the cost of having an infection to your downstream like you're talking about, you know, uh, Ardarsh? And, and, and so you think about just the device costs, but also what are the downstream costs when you have something like this? And, and if you're losing your screening colonoscopies from that, that's a huge loss. And so you do have to value those type of things. And I think Raman, you, you recently published a very good study on the cost effectiveness of this, of looking at the exalt scope and, and single use and kind of even had some thoughts about what you included as being part of the cost effectiveness analysis. So I don't know if you can enlighten us on that a little bit. You know? Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, this was, uh, we, we kind of, uh, we had to redo the paper in the middle because, uh, we ended up uh, having to model the fact that we also got reimbursement uh, now, which uh, is true. And that's uh, that's a big factor here is that uh, if the government feels this is important enough and is going to fund it, at least in the United States, it becomes more feasible. But, uh, you know, as you say, it's really, it's very hard to model this exactly as you said, Chris, not only because of the individual patient got the infection and cholangitis caused this much, but, 
relating to issues that Adarsh said, the institutional reputation and the loss of, you know, we had people canceling elective orthopedic surgeries uh, for a while. So, you know, so it's very hard to model some of these things, but but clearly, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the price of the RCP, as I've said many times, is going to go up simply because we're going to have to adopt new things, uh, new technologies, whether it's reusable or not. Um, and I think we're trying to all just figure out what's the best way to spend our money, right? And how much is enough? You know, does, can we get close enough to zero and is that sufficient? Do we have to get to zero? Can we get to zero something other than just single use? Um, and, you know, these are all good questions that we don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see the time. Well, and then we have the FDA, you know, in 2019 saying hospitals and institutions should start thinking about, you know, moving towards um, better designs to avoid infections, whether that's fully disposable or the disposable caps. And I think there were some goals to try to have most institutions try to make some sort of switch even by next year, um, which I think is, is gonna be impossible just in terms of ramping up production of any of these new types of scopes. But clearly the FDA uh, has made it known that they think we should be moving towards this. Yeah, and I think they particularly like the single use concept only because I think it gets them out of an uncomfortable situation, which is uh, documenting the ability to reprocess because right? yeah. they, you know, how do you validate the reprocessing device, you know, low temperature. So I think they're very fond of the single use, but they don't have to deal with that issue as long as it affects it's safe. Um, and so, and that's why they've given it a breakthrough designation, which in part has allowed for compensation um, for the use of that. But I think, you know, we don't have all the answers right now. Probably, you know, single use scopes or the disposable cap scopes will make their way into a lot of different units. And as was stated earlier in some of the presentations, perhaps there'll be unique situations, um, you know, where you will opt for those scopes off the bat, especially the single use, the low volume centers, the intraop cases, those patients that can't tolerate an infection and just kind of have it as part of your, your army of scopes, um, at least in the beginning. But I guess we would say in five years, if you would want to put a bet on us moving completely to disposable scopes, who would say yes on the panel? I'll say it's still gonna be a mixture. Yeah, I, in five years, yeah, definitely, I think. Ten? You think, do you think it's really moving towards that where it's gonna go fully disposable? Uh, I think maybe perhaps in some systems, I, I globally, no. Uh, but, but I think could some systems do it? Perhaps, you know, but obviously price is gonna have to come down for sure. Yeah. And, um... Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's going to be some kind of hybrid. Um, I, I think that there's certain volume centers where all this headache about reprocessing and, and uh, renewing scope leases and things, I think some institutions may realize it just makes sense just to go fully, fully uh, single use. Um, and even, even within a system, for example, if you have an ASC where you'd like to be able to do some basic ERCPs, maybe stent poles and things like that, it may make sense to have a couple of the single use devices on the shelf rather than investing in an entire you know additional device and then figuring out how you're going to go and reprocess it properly if it's out in an ASC instead of at the home center you know as, as certain examples so I, I think likely it's going to be a hybrid not just from the infection standpoint but also from practicality Chris yeah I think I think I mean as, as the technology continues to evolve we're going to see you know higher quality imaging we're going to see improvements and in, in some of the issues with like scope stiffness, some of these early issues. And, and I think to Ron's point, it's like, you just have to get using it more. I mean, you change out the buttons on one of our scopes and you notice there's a difference immediately. And so there is, we're used to our devices. It's gonna take time to change. But once you see that as technology advances, I think there's gonna be more widespread adoption for some, for some people. And then also it's only gonna take one more outbreak, I think, to come back into light again. And I think it's a little bit, we haven't heard the news about it lately. And as we know, sometimes when it's all quiet, you kind of forget about things and you kind of move away from it. But all this is going to take is one more outbreak and it's going to be all back again. And so it just depends on the scope of the problem and how much of these things are going to continue to change. And we all know that these infective bugs are probably not going anywhere. So continue adaptive to this environment and our keeping our patients safe is going to be key. So I think you will see more movement to this or more disposable um, and, and more units um, with more time.
Um, we'll just finish up with uh, a couple audience questions for the panel. Have any of your other scopes moved to fully disposable models? Because the question becomes, if you if you can get rid of reprocessing altogether by moving your whole fleet to a, a disposable model. I don't, uh, we definitely are, are nowhere near that. And I don't think anyone is at this point. I agree. Uh, and then uh, one other question, how can we single out the scope as the culprit of the infection if the other accessories are used during the procedure? Um, I think because that's, go ahead, Roman. No, I, well, because most of the accessories should be single use too. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I don't know if that, you know, unless I don't try to think of a reusable accessory, but uh, and well, if not, they're usually sterilized, right? So, at so that we, point, yeah. We think I they're, agree. that's probably it. Scope is the one reusable component. Yeah. And we're really talking about exogenous infections from another patient being given to a, a different patient, not really, you know, your own body's flora. Because as soon as you put even a single use through the mouth, you've got stuff on the tip of the scope. But um, you know, that I think is, goes back to what I was saying, where that's, that's an inherent risk of us putting, doing any procedure of any sort in any patient, but it's really, you're going to feel bad if it was one, one patient who contaminates another when there was something you could have done about it. And I think that, you know, one, one great thing about the program that we have coming up, um, uh, ongoing is we'll get to explore, you know, what, what might those things be in addition to kind of what we've introduced here. Yep. I think on that note, uh, we'll, we'll call it call it a closed session. I wanna thank all the panelists for their participation and especially all the attendees uh, who are taking the initiative to learn more about this infection control issue. And hopefully we provided you with a lot of uh, information to think about uh, as we move through this program over the coming months. Uh, and then you'll see early next year, our uh, second uh, live webinar. So thank you. And thank you for your participation in today's event. You will now be redirected to the post-event survey. If you are unable to access the survey immediately, please wait five minutes while attendance is verified and then reload the page to try again. This concludes today's program.